Hi, my name is uh, Dagan. I'm a developer and occasionally a security researcher. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working primarily as a Kubernetes platform engineer. And um, I really enjoy working in Kubernetes and compliant and restricted environments. So I think things like um, SOC 2 and FedRAMP, sort of my happy place. Uh, my name is Will Klein. I'm also a platform slash security engineer. Um, you know, it's been really exciting for me to watch Kubernetes grow over the last couple of years. You know, I kind of started out doing uh, containers in kind of similar environments as what Dagan's described, and we were, you know, orchestrating them with Salt Stack. I don't know if you guys remember Salt Stack back in the day, but like, you know, just seeing that grow over time has been incredible. And um, I'm also kind of working with Dagan on different projects to help modernize deployments for uh, different customers that we work together with. Today we're going to be talking about third-party applications, um, why we love them, some of the dangers that they impose. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about a third-party application? And basically, ever since subroutines were invented in the 1940s, people have been running other people's code. So third-party is code that you didn't write. And the question um, is not, do I use third-party applications? It is an absolute surety that you are going to use a third-party application. Yeah, and I think one of the best things about Kubernetes in my experience has been, you know, going from that world where, you know, vendors would deliver you a random RPM file or even like a tarball, and then, you know, eventually it turned into like a VM that they would deliver to you, and you'd have to figure out what's in this VM, what does it need to run, how do I need to network it together, like what is it, what is it bringing to my... Um, my network here and what about when I install it? How do I meet my security baselines? And now with Kubernetes, we're delivering applications and getting applications from third-party vendors, which have a full description of, you know, what kind of containers does it need? What is the networking requirements? What kind of service account access does it need? And it brings all of that together in a really beautiful API that I can use, you know, whether I'm deploying an ingress on ALBs and AWS or I'm using metal LB on my bare metal servers, I've got that one API that I can learn about and introspect and understand what I'm about to ingest and bring into my cluster. So the, in, in addition to Kubernetes itself, what do we add on top of it? Well, Pretty generally, we're going to add observability. We're going to um, potentially add a GitOps agent of some sort. If you're not using that sh yet, you should be. Um, you're going to have your database engines, which might be running in the cluster. They might not be. Uh, that It sort of depends. What about your base containers? Right? If you're running a language like Java, then you're bringing in an open JDK or you know, maybe something direct from Oracle uh, Java base container. What about all of the packages that are running on that base container? Or Node.js also has a lot of extra packages in that base container. If any of those have, if any of that's exposed externally, like let's say Grafana, um, and Grafana has a vulnerability in the web UI, your cluster now has a vulnerability. If there is a vulnerability inside the uh, in a, you know, cluster network, a service level thing, then your cluster has a vulnerability that might be used either as a pivot or a um, uh, escalation of privilege. Sorry, space for a second there. <laughs> so we need to be really aware of all of those, and we need to think about those possibilities as we're deploying our applications. Essentially, when code is vulnerable, your cluster is vulnerable. I like this little picture because I picture the uh, third-party application being the ladder that you're walking across, right? You can sit there and be like, well, I didn't write this ladder, but if it, if it fails, it's a long way down for you. Um, back in August, Will and I gave a presentation at DEF CON, and we're going to give you a short snippet of that presentation here in just a minute. And before I do, it's sort of sped up because that's not what this conversation today is about. But it's a, I think it sort of sets the tone of why today's conversation is so important. So what we did at DEF CON is we took three vulnerabilities that we had found in common Kubernetes third-party applications, specifically Kiali, uh, Fleet, which is a GitOps agent from the folks at Rancher, and Longhorn, which is a distributed storage mechanism for Kubernetes, also from the folks at Rancher. And we had found various vulnerabilities over the years. They were all patched. They were all responsibly disclosed well before we started talking about them and, and demonstrating how to take advantage of them. Uh, but what, we've, what we realized you could do with them is you could actually chain them together to go from completely outside the cluster to running as root on a cluster node, which is as bad as it can possibly be. So I'm going to play the video, but real quick, just so that I don't have to race through and try and narrate for anybody who's interested into how the attacks work. 
starts off with Kiali, which is exposed through a web UI. Back in 2019, I had identified that there's actually a hard-coded secret in Kiali, or was rather, a hard-coded secret, and it, that was what was being used to sign the jots used for authentication to the web uh, UI. So all I needed to do was you know, mint my own jot using that hard-coded secret, and I would be admin on Kiali, which was fantastic. From there, uh, we realized from looking at some logs from Fleet that when Fleet has an error trying to reach a repository, it logs the URI that it passed to a third-party library to access that, and that URI in, uh, includes embedded in it Base64 encoded the private SSH key that was used to access the Git repository, which means that if you can get access to that log, you can then access that repository you know, as that GitOps user. And then finally, Longhorn. In Longhorn, we identified back in, uh, was it 20, it was just last year, it was 2021. Yeah, 2021. So last December, there is a API that's exposed inside the cluster that allows you to, allows the Longhorn manager to specify a binary and a string of arguments that it wants the agent to run in the context of, of that container. It's, it was a completely unauthenticated API, so if you could discover that running in the cluster, which was effectively running as a daemon set, so any node that was, was listening on port 8500, you could you know, say, hey, I want you to run echo out to a file, and it just does it. You can also use that to pop a reverse shell, which is what we did. And um, additionally, because of the privileges that Longhorn needs to do its work, it's running as root, and it had several um, host paths mounted that we were then able to use for a full container escape. So show you what that looked like. So again, it was a chain of three, of, uh, three different vulnerabilities. Here we're starting with Kiali, just using Jot.io's to mint our own um, token here. And then that token gets embedded in a cookie value. So I just use developer tools in Safari to drop it on in there. That's all it took for me to be admin in Kiali. One of the things that Kiali does is it allows you to access logs of running workloads, which is super useful when you're trying to you know, diagnose what's going on within your service mesh. That includes logs from Fleet that may, actually, may include a SSH private key and the URL to, that private, or to the repository that that private key can be used as. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up my terminal to use that SSH key to log in uh, to Git and see what's in this repository. All right, so it's just a pretty bare uh, Helm chart. All I need to do is add a job that's gonna give me uh, whatever my attack payload is and um, push that back up and then GitOps is gonna do GitOps. It's gonna deploy my job. So I started listening on port 12345 for my reverse shell and I went ahead and started that. And then this part, is, it fast forwarded quite a bit, it took about a minute and a half for Fleet to do its magic, but eventually I was running and um, have my reverse shell. There we go. So now I'm running in my, in my payload, which has a little bit of tooling in it, and I'm just gonna go ahead and use Nmap in this uh, next segment and um, see what's running. And specifically, again, I was looking for port 8500, and it looks like there was two nodes that were running it. And I'm gonna use the exploit that we developed called Rustler and just say, you know, hey, go launch this attack payload on the remote, uh, or on the, uh, in, on the Longhorn pod, and connect back to me on port 12346, uh, I think. There we go. And now I'm connected and I'm running as root, and then a quick container escape. And I'm gonna run cry control here in a second and show you that I basically have completely taken over the cluster. There we go. So now I'm running as root on the, um, the node that's running Longhorn, which is pretty devastating. So with all that, you know, um, how can we prevent that? I mean, this was a complex attack, right? We chained together three different vulnerabilities, but it really didn't need to be. 
if you look at just Kiali, if Kiali's run, not running in read-only mode, you can do devastating attacks just on that very first phase. Um, complete traffic management, fun things like that. The, with Fleet, it's running as GitOps. You know, there's probably not a lot of restrictions on what you're allowing your GitOps service account to install into your cluster. So I didn't need to bother pivoting to Longhorn. I could have just installed you know, my own daemon set from the get-go. And then finally, you know, with Longhorn, you know, that was, um, uh, you, you <laughs> let your imagination go wild, right? And you, if you already are running in a multi-tenanted environment, then so, uh, something like Longhorn's vulnerability is truly devastating because you know, anybody that's running a workload in your cluster is gonna be able to take advantage of that. Let's see, one thing I do wanna point out with these three also is these are not poorly written applications, right? So uh, SUSE and Red Hat know how to develop software, and they worked really well with us when we reached out to, uh, to disclose the vulnerabilities. So this isn't about saying like, oh, there's bad software out there. It's more about saying almost all software at some point in time has a bug in it, whether it's you know, from a reputable software um, shop like SUSE and Red Hat, or it's from some rando on GitHub. Yeah, so um, basically, at, while we were putting the, together, together that DEF CON talk, um, and immediately after this, these vulnerabilities were disclosed and we're kind of reevaluating things, you know, Dave and I started having a conversation about, you know, how did we end up getting here? Because, you know, obviously, third party apps are necessary to be running your cluster. You know, I don't, who among us wrote Kubernetes, right? <laughs> like, it is all third party they software. Are here, the ones that wrote Kubernetes. <laughs> yes, but like one person did not write it. And, you know, we're all, we're all using it together. So, kind of the question that we had is like, as an organization, how can we be looking at third party applications as we bring them into our cluster? And how do we make sure that we can make, find things that align to our internal development practices? So, um, at the job that we were working with together on this, um, there were all these CI CD requirements, SAS, DAS, all this stuff, fuzzing in place, um, a lot of merge request controls. And one of the questions we had was like, how can we make sure that we are looking at the whole application lifecycle? Because when it came to third party applications, uh, our shop, and I'm sure many, many other places, were looking at that CVE scan and coming back like, no CVEs, no problems, right? Um, so we started talking about like, how do, we, how do we start looking at applications to really figure out what needs to be done to you know, put ourselves in a good position next time this happens. So this is an opinionated approach, but our approach starts with an initial review. Um, basically, the, the goal is to answer a pretty simple question. Do I want to commit to running this application in my cluster? So here's how we go about solving that or answering that particular question. The first thing I think is, is important to understand is this is not about a single point in time. Pretty much any application that's been around long enough is that, and used widely enough is at some point in time gonna have a CVE. Eventually, it'll probably have a devastating CVE. So it's not about saying, what is the state of this application right now? I now make a permanent decision for all of time that this is safe and it can move forward. It's more about what is the project look like? How is it managed? How many contributors are there? What, what sort of thought are the contributors putting into the dependencies that they rely on or don't rely on? See, it's, um, ah, yes, security policies as well. You know, is there a security policy? Is, do they publish security advisories? Do they even publish CVEs? If, you, if an application is not using GitHub security advisories or CVEs, your scanners are not gonna find anything because they're pulling from a vulnerability database that has no entries for that application. That doesn't mean the application has no vulnerabilities, it just means they're not telling us about them. So it's really important that we look for applications that do, or projects that do, publish security advisories. Um, so anyway, so we're working on these projects together and um, you know, we're, one of the examples that came up in our development cycle immediately after the Longhorn incident, uh, we were looking at Binami Sealed Secrets at the time. Uh, really, the Binami Sealed Secrets didn't fit, you know, it's a fine project. It just didn't fit into the security model that we were internally developing where Vault was a single source of truth. Uh, so we started looking around for alternatives to uh, Binami Sealed Secrets and you know, we started looking around and coming up with a list of alternatives and we decided you know, at that point, we should be applying things to this search so that we are evaluating not just you know, the point in time, does this have CVEs? Is it publishing those CVEs? 
Um, does the specific container have CVs? But instead, look more holistically at the whole project. And you know, we worked together to assemble this list of potential candidates, and then we started analyzing them, you know, really trolling through their GitHub projects to see what they were doing internally and see if that kind of aligned with our values. Uh, so while we were looking through this, um, we were going through and you know, we came across this OSSF scorecard thing. So basically the OSSF scorecard is going to be an application that you can run uh, as part of either your CI CD pipeline or just run it from your desktop here. And it basically goes into the, the application on GitHub or PyPy or NPM and then analyze, tries to analyze it for a lot of these things that we've been talking about, you know, making sure that you know, they're using best practices and disclosing vulnerabilities, that they are doing some sort of vulnerability scans in their code base as automatically as CI CD systems. Um, it's checking to make sure that they're mer they've got good merge hygiene in terms of you know, who are people going through merge requests to merge into the master. So, uh, from our perspective, these are all of the things that we were requiring the developers within our program to do before they could run their code in our production cluster. And it made sense to us to apply those same requirements to third-party applications that we as the platform maintainers were bringing into the platform. So we're going to get a little quick. Hopefully people can read this. So this is, can, can everyone read that? I think we got a review earlier. Yeah, so basically we have... Um, Here's kind of the first half of the scorecard. We broke it up. So it's looking at whether the binary artifacts are being published. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. They're looking at the settings within GitHub to make sure that branch protection is enabled and the main production branch is not being uh, just randomly committed to and pushed to by outsiders. Um, it's looking at the CI CD tests. It's looking for CII best practices. You know, the CII best practices is actually the projects themselves will begin embedding this. And you'll, 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 once you know to look for it, a lot of projects are including this. I know Cilium has it. I know Argo has it on their GitHub page where there's the badge that kind of shows their OSSF scorecard. And what we take that to mean is that the, the, the application developers themselves are now conscious that we are all looking for these best practices. You know, I, I've been sitting in this room all week here listening to a lot of really great talks about different tools to enable SBOM management. But at the end of the day, the thing as a maintainer, you know, as someone who's not deploying, you know, sharing my tools outside, I'm looking for development processes that I can trust and I can believe in, and that OSSF scorecard represents that to me. And it lets me know that the application developers are very much aware of security in the same way that I am aware of security. Um, it's looking at you know, contributors. So one of the things that we've run into in a couple, I think we've got an example of this down the line, is you know, if an application only has one company that's contributing to it or maintaining it, or, or even one, one contributor, <laughs> yeah, one contributor you know, maybe that person gets sick, maybe they change jobs, maybe they get uninterested, right? If, if there's one company that's maintaining the future of this project, then it's hard to rely on them and not, not it's rely, hard to rely on them long term because it you don't know what their interests are going to be you maybe they start making decisions that are orthogonal to your security plans um, seeing that a project has lots of contributors and maintainers helps you understand that you know there are a lot of stakeholders here that will try to keep it in line so you can believe in the vision long term uh let's see i think those are all yeah you know it's looking for workflow patterns that are dangerous making sure it's using some sort of like dependabot type tool to is looking at the dependencies uh, making sure it's using fuzzing in the project, the licenses. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through all this. And I think one of the things that's interesting with OSSF Scorecard is that because it's a relatively new tool, a lot of applications out there do not have stellar score. Actually, can you go back? I, that's something. Yeah, at the top there. So this is the external secrets. You know, you can see that they have uh, that 6.0 out of 10. That's actually a relatively good score because a lot of these stuff, you know, as teams start adopting the OSS scorecard model and hosting this on their GitHub page, they're going to start being aware of it. And once they're aware of it, we can trust that they're going to be improving those scores over time. Uh, we thought this was a really cool tool. It really answered a lot of the things. And it was really cool from our perspective to uh, talk about all this stuff that we wanted to get done and then look forward and find the tool that does exactly the thing that we're thinking about and having our internal discussions about. Um, so once you have that scorecard in hand, that's, that's not everything. There are a couple other things that I think are harder to assess automatically. Um, you know, depreciation policies in place. You, know, you, you never want to end up in a situation where something happens upstream and you're suddenly depreciated, but you don't have time to integrate it in with your project. Um, 
making sure that they're showing like, you know, if the application says it's in beta, trust that they're in beta. Like the, only the developers can make that call. Um, don't trust anyone that's, I've seen too many things that people are deploying this new jazzy cool beta application into their cluster and then something wildly changes about it and breaks all their stuff and they're like stuck, right? Because they can't upgrade anymore. All right, so at this point, I'd venture to guess between open source security foundation scorecards and all the added research that Will had done on external secrets, that's far more work that has gone into a third party application than most cluster administrators put in. Um, I, I'd love to be proven wrong on that. I'd love for the industry to move towards something that's, that's much more diligent ab about the review process. So are we done? Did we do, you know, did we high five, do we install external secrets operator and call it a day? Well, not quite. Because even when the application is going through all of these security reviews and whatnot, there's more to it than just that, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, once we, once we kind of settled on the external secrets operator as the way we wanted to go forward with this because we like it as a project, you know, at some point you do actually have to do those scans and gather that point in time analysis of what is the exact security of the container and the Helm chart that I'm about to bring in. Um, we're not going to talk too much about hardening. There's been a lot of talks today that cover it far more in depth than we want to. And, you know, I definitely recommend you look at our GitHub, our, uh, our DEF CON talk about specifics of how we were hardening the Longhorn containers. We uncovered all these vulnerabilities. Um, but basically, we want to say that, you know, this is, when you start bringing something in, you know, one of the things that I think I would chalk it up to hubris on our part, when we started bringing things in like Longhorn, um, we, we were looking at the project and saying like, oh, we'll just, you know, harden it one time and bring it into the cluster and then everyone will clap their hands and start using it. And what we realized is that you really do need to have that ownership and that plan of not only going to hire, not only am I going to harden the container today, but I'm going to have to harden it tomorrow and next week and next month and a year from now. You know, that, that job never ends. So finding projects that kind of align with the security models that you internally want to push in place is going to make that, that delta a lot smaller so that you're not applying a lot of big changes to it. Um, this was one of the things that we came into with Longhorn that we'll talk in a bit, like where we were applying a lot of hardening changes on it that became very fragile long term because it was not meeting the upstream project's guidance and direction that they were going. And as that delta grew, so did our work. Um, so, you know, we go over whatever the process is for hardening it so that it meets the guidelines that at least well, the guidelines that you're putting forth to your developers and application developers on your cluster. Um, now we want to talk about what happens when the next version gets released. So, you know, a week from now, new version drops, new container. Um, what we were doing internally at that point is we were building, taking Docker files and having like a from line of the upstream and then layering on our changes, you know, changing it so it doesn't run as root, removing unnecessary packages one by one, um, building that process out so it was relatively automated, and then using the upstream project's automated tests to know whether or not our hardening was breaking it because, you know, we, we don't want to have to run through the manual tests every time we apply our changes. We just want to apply our hardening changes to their container and then run their automated test suite to confirm that it's still going to work the way the maintainer intended it to. One thing that I'd want to add here as well is just how difficult it becomes to harden an application is, I think, itself a little bit of a smell about the overall security of the application. It, young, less mature applications, on average, are far less secure. We do have, you know, some very security conscious open source application the creators out there that start strong but not everybody does. A lot of the time, things come in over time. There was a great talk here last night from the folks that are maintaining Argo CD talking about what happened when they went through that uh, step up from you know, uh, uh, incubation to a fully released CNCF project and the security team that they worked with to understand some of those things. So as you're going through this, if you're fighting that application a lot, it's really truly is something to consider. Is this worth it? Do I, do I need to find a different solution? So for, in a di one of the nice things that we found is, is uh, the, the folks at Aquasec have just been absolutely knocking it out of the park with Trivi. It has become such an invaluable tool that we use it for almost everything that it, it'll do. Um, we, it'll scan your, your images and let you know 
you know, not only are there vulnerable packages installed by the OS, uh, but there's, you know, we found these static libraries embedded in this Go uh, application as well. So that's really useful, th you know, it's sort of a starting point, right? You know, Will had, had some other good tips as far as not running as roots, things like that. But um, really, it, it's, it's, yeah, use Trivi. There's a, there's a <laughs> QR code there. Um, here's a quick walkthrough of using Trivi. Yes. I like to run it in Docker myself, just so that I don't have all these different versions of the tools running around on my local machine. Um, it's that fast. I didn't speed that up at all. And that's just like regular playback. And you can see from this, there are some issues, right? It looks like really they need, the um, external secrets needs to update the uh, AWS SDK library that they're using, assuming that there's a newer version available. Um, Is it replaying? Yeah. So in that particular case, there weren't any vulnerabilities, nothing you know, that we really needed to worry about. But what about when there are vulnerabilities that we need to worry about? So here's a use of the uh, uh, Tamarin base image for running uh, JRE applications. And um, when I scanned that, it did have a couple of vulnerabilities in them. Trivi's output included a fi the fixed version. So I'm just really easily able to run apt to, to do a pinned upgrade to the fixed version. If, it's a, if it is a source code, like a language dependency though, I'm gonna tell you, you do not wanna get into the business of forking every application that you're running, every third party application. So in that particular case, I, I really recommend you just make a go, no go decision. It's either not going to be something that is super you know, traumatic and you're, eventually it'll get patched upstream or yank the application out of your cluster. Don't try to fix the application unless you are actually a maintainer or contributor to that application. Um, yeah, so a lot of places that I work kind of have this, this mentality where we do that scan at the beginning and no, no CVs, no problems. Um, meanwhile, the application itself is surrounded by this like nebulous group of the Helm chart that is like, you know, we run into this all the time and, you know, we're not here to like bash on a lot of companies. It's just stuff that we see where, you know, applications have, I run into literal applications that have a flag in the Helm chart for run is non-root and then try to call init containers that run as root and ignore the flag and you're just like come on guys like this is you know and especially when i'm supporting developers that are you know off the, their golang or java developers that really aren't kubernetes centric yet and i'm trying to provide the off side of this devops so i'm working with them and i've got to tell them like hey just because you found this helm chart that deployed the thing you wanted that runs really well locally doesn't mean that we can use it on our platform and the nice thing is again you know trivia does everything right trivia will scan a helm chart trivia will scan the, uh, a, a workload running in a Kubernetes cluster, and it'll give you feedback of what, about the, the security posture of that application as it's deployed. So here's just doing the exact same thing as before, walking through what it takes to scan a Helm chart. I did speed this one up a little bit. It took about three or four seconds uh, once it started running. And you get some very helpful output. Again, it's, it's a starting point. It's, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is it running as root because it needs to, or is it running as root and it should not be? And in this case, it didn't need to be. Let's see. I think we can just, uh, yep. yeah. Um, so as you can see with the trivia output in hand, you know, we now have the point in time snapshot of the application and running inside the container. That seems to have, you know, some things in it, but we're willing to accept some risk on this. You know, it's absolutely, we never, it's never an all or nothing, right? You've got to balance the value something brings to your organization versus the potential risk of bringing it into your cluster. Um, now we have the Helm chart scan, you know, that we can decide again, is that something we want to do? Is it something we don't? Um, but, you know, now we can see exactly, you know, and this is, goes back to my thing about why Kubernetes is so powerful and how I sell it to all the security folks that are out there, like, you know, saying no to everything, right? Kubernetes gives us the opportunity to run standardized tools like this to understand exactly how an application is going to be deployed into our environment in a way that we've never really had that sort of visibility for like VMs and things like that coming into our environment. All right, so we've decided that we like external secret operator based on the Helm charts, on the containers, development practices, all that. Um, we felt really good about it. So kind of the next step is forking the upstream chart, and Dagan's going to talk a little bit about that process and why we do that. Yeah, so 
Um, I do, as much as I say don't fork the source code and build it yourself, I've, my experience, if there are exceptions to this, but generally you're gonna end up having to fork the upstream Helm chart. Helm charts tend to be community developed. They tend to be designed in a way that just simply running Helm install pretty much guarantees that it's gonna work. And then there's usually very helpful configurations that you can add on that will ultimately harden the application. But in a secure and hardened environment, the places that we work, you have to be secure by default. You need to have every one of those security constraints enabled from the beginning so that a Helm install gives you the most secure option and you actually have to take action in order to, le in order to make it less secure in a development environment, for example. So what I find is you can use their Helm chart as a starting point, but you tend to end up having to run it yourself or, or write the Helm chart yourself. All right, so once you've got the, a, a hardened image, you have a hardened or rewritten Helm chart, what do you do? Well, that's the easy part. <laughs> All you have to do is run a Helm install or go through your GitOps uh, process, whatever, whatever is your organization's methodology here. Um, we, again, we definitely want to make sure that our clusters themselves are hardened and that our practices meet those or work alongside those hardening requirements. So for example, we don't run our Kubernetes clusters with the API exposed to the public internet, which means that if a developer is working remotely, unless they're coming in through a VPN, they're not going to be able to just run, you know, K8 supply or, or sorry, kubectl apply or Helm install, and nor should they in most environments. So that means that you need to have a GitOps workflow. Um, and then you want to also continue to monitor those applications. You should know what the meaningful metrics are, and you should have alerting thresholds that let you know if an application has gone down. Because remember, uh, availability is a security control, right? A denial of service is a threat. So you want to make sure that you're aware of when that application goes down. Um, and then you want to constantly monitor as it sits there deployed, and you want to reassess that application on a regular basis. You should be running vulnerability scans on a daily basis. A daily basis. Ideally, you should have some sort of a security operator running in your cluster that is alerting you when it finds a vulnerability running in, your, on, you know, in, in an application that, that you're running. You need to be able to patch critical vulnerabilities. Typically, less than seven days is what is what the compliance frameworks will tell you. Um, depending on what it is, sometimes you get that phone call of like, you gotta go now. We all remember you know, uh, uh, Blog for Shell and Heartbleed where everything just hit the fan and everybody had a terrible Christmas. Um, and then also, you really need good intra-organization communication. If, if you're using something like a base container, where you, your team is like, oh, hey, we'll go ahead and we'll harden this base container for Java, and then everybody else can use it, and you, you, know, you can really scale out our efforts there, you need to make sure that those teams have an understanding of, hey, we've updated this image. You now need to redeploy, rebuild and redeploy your application that's built on top of that, because the way containerization works, until they rebuild, it's still not patched on their image. All right, so here's the questions that we want you to answer at the end of the day, is, you know, on a regular basis. Is the project still actively maintained? We were working with uh, uh, KIM mm -hmm. to get uh, uh, AWS credentials into applications, and the maintainers had pivoted away from it because they were like, oh, the OIDC provider for EKS works wonders. We weren't running EKS, so we couldn't use it. So it was a deprecated project, but there was nothing we can do about it. So is that project still being actively maintained? If there's any security incidents have happened, how were they addressed? Was there good communication from the maintainers? Was there a patch made readily available? Was there security advisories? You know, all of those things. Internally, do the current owners still want to own it? If they've pivoted onto Golang from Java, then who's going to take over that, J that JRE base image that everybody else is relying on? Overall, is it meeting your organization's needs? And you know, if not, what else is in the ecosystem today? So as a final recap, because we're right on time here, <laughs> um, initial review, then harden, then deploy, monitor, and, re and then ongoing reviews.
Yeah, and I think that's really important to make sure that we're also reviewing that upstream, as he said. Um, we've run into multiple examples where the upstream started diverging away from what we were intending to use the project for, um, at least from a security baseline perspective. So, you know, understanding that upstream process and being very active there, um, working in our spaces that we've had trouble getting things upstreamed patch-wise, but that's always the dream is, you know, if you, you're making something more secure, if you can get that upstream, and this is the value proposition to your, your customer group who's saying no, right? Tell them, like, if I can get this upstreamed, the labor costs and savings down the line is going to be so much cleaner. That is our time. We'll be hanging out. If anybody has any questions, feel free to come up, say hi. We'll do our best to answer them. We do love feedback um, as presenters. It's, it's invaluable to us. So there's a barcode in the bottom right corner there. If you can scan that and offer any feedback, positive, negative, it all helps. Thank you, both. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of KubeCon.